There is something you begin to realize when you meet someone living with a virus that has changed their life. How sick did you get? Um, I almost died. You see it when you are with them in exam rooms. Any chest pain or chest tightness? Sí, mucho. When you are in their homes. It's like, but you look fine. I understand I look fine, but I'm not fine. You realize that what has taken the place of the initial COVID-19 infection. And I miss her a lot because she, she was a healthy woman. What has settled into the bodies and lives of millions of people is devastating and can vary from one person to the next. You'll meet four of the estimated 400,000 people in Georgia living with long COVID. They are different races and sexes and ages. I think I'm probably considered a long hauler at this point. But they share the same struggle of living with long COVID in all its manifestations. A lot of people say, it's just a flu, it's gonna be fine, I'll get it and I'll move on. And that's what I thought last August. Here I am 14 months later with my life completely upended. The way I look at it is you have a hurricane that comes in. The hurricane uh, may last for three to four days, it goes away, but the damage it leaves in its wake, it takes years before that destruction is made up and you, know, you go back to life as normal. With each passing month, we are learning more about how dramatically COVID can impact the brain. Especially in people that have long COVID, uh, 50 to 80% of them have neurologic symptoms. People experiencing long COVID have been told it's in their head, or their doctors admit they don't know how to help them. And that's one of the challenges in, in long COVID right now. We don't have good diagnostic, there's no single diagnostic test. Were you like waking up because you were really anxious? There are fewer than 50 long COVID clinics around the country, and pulmonologist Dr. Alex Trong helps to run one of them at Emory University Hospital in Midtown Atlanta. I think by the time they get to us, they have suffered for quite a while. More often than not, six months, nine months, a year of daily symptoms. I think they're exhausted. I think that they're beaten. Ms. Leon Perez? Hey, how you doing? Buenos dias. 55-year-old Norma Leon Perez collapsed in her home on Christmas Eve of 2020. Her whole family had COVID. Perez, a diabetic, wound up hospitalized on a ventilator for a month and in rehab for another two months. Could I take a quick listen to you? Can I examine you? Your heart seems very fast. Does it always run very fast? In a wheelchair now, she is a shadow of her former healthy, active self. She used to work in church, help the kids, and she go to the community, help the community. We used to do a lot of things like for food bank. She can't hardly eat as well. Everything she eats, she throws it up. And walking right now, you see, she, you've seen her, she can't hardly walk. She, she tries to, but she faints too much. She gets too dizzy. In the hour Dr. Trong spends with Norma with a translator on the phone, Señora, las rodillas, los pies. the long list of symptoms are revealed. Her hands are weak and they hurt. Her joints ache. She has tingling and numbness all over. Her heart races. She faints when she stands. She has pain in her chest. Have you been losing hair? Perez has brain fog and anxiety. She says she was never anxious before COVID. This is nine months after she got the virus. There's a lot of what you are telling me that I see in patients who have had COVID infection like yourself. So I think that a lot of your symptoms may be a combination of both being in the ICU as well as having COVID. I'm gonna give you a second inhaler to use. Dr. Trong orders more blood tests, prescribes medication, physical therapy, and refers her to a cardiologist and neurologist. I always thought that I could take care of really sick patients and the patients I've taken care of, I thought were very sick. I've never taken care of this level of illness. I've never seen patients this sick. I haven't had many moments where I panicked in the ICU as much as I did last year. I've never had so many patients die on me. What Trong and healthcare workers and COVID patients across the country have come to discover is that the worst of COVID does not always go away. They are just now figuring out how to treat it to alleviate the suffering for people who cannot get their health or their lives back. We've been really frustrated in trying to treat it because all their lab work looks okay, all the testing have looked fine, all the imaging is looking fine, there's no blood, nothing that we can point to that's causing it. 
PASC, post-acute sequelae SARS-CoV-2 infection, is the name the NIH gave to what most people call long COVID. Some call themselves long haulers. Millions of Americans never recovered from their COVID infections, or they recovered and then relapsed, sometimes with new symptoms. Yes. Trong says brain fog and fatigue are two of the most common symptoms in his patients. Patients tell me a very similar story. What they say is they have problems remembering words. So words will uh, escape them. They will forget that um, you know, the coffee maker is called a coffee maker, and they'll say that thing. They will also lose track of information in the middle of sentences or conversation. Patients also report not being able to sleep or needing to sleep 12 to 14 hours, and that the smallest task or effort exhausts them. Horrible, horrible fatigue. I could cook dinner, but clean up the kitchen, it's like, no, that's not happening. Get some coffee rolling. Pat Aronson and her husband, Neil, got COVID in December of 2020. My husband started showing symptoms a few days after Christmas. My symptoms showed, started showing New Year's Day. Me, I'm feeling fine. After a few weeks, Pat's husband got better. She did not. Debilitating joint pain, fatigue, and brain fog remained. Everything just tingles and hurts. And you know there's no relief. And so the only relief you can think of is, like, well, if I rip off my skin, rip off the nerve endings, and I won't hurt anymore. I mean, it's just awful. Okay. I struggled this morning getting up. Aronson waited six weeks to see Dr. Trong. I did get relief once I got vaccinated. Every now and then, I'll get the smell of burning cigarettes. Trong runs her through some cognitive testing. Over the next minute, can you give me as many words as you can, starting with the letter F? Go. Fog, fall, fell, fail, fat. Fun. Jeez. <laughs> I'm not going to promise that anything's going to be oh. easy about any of this because nothing has been easy in the last year and a half. Trong prescribes Pat ADHD medication. Some patients say it improves their brain fog and fatigue. It is difficult to talk to patients to say, I don't know what's going on and I don't know what we can do to help, but we're going to try these things, you know? Or, you know, I've taken care of X number of patients who've had similar stuff, and you know, this is what seems to have worked, so I'm gonna try it on you, but I can't promise you that this is going to be the magic bullet. The CDC describes long COVID as a wide range of new, returning, or ongoing health problems people can experience four or more weeks after first being infected with COVID-19. The CDC's website lists 18 of the more common symptoms, but there are many more that people report experiencing. The challenge is to understand the after effects of COVID and what can be done to help those living with it. The first goal? is to prevent it. Vaccinations cut down the rate of long COVID by about 50%. The drugs that he used. Dr. Vikas Sukhatmi has spent a good portion of his career in cancer research. About... His wife, Vitala, has a background in epidemiology. And together, they've been exploring how certain FDA-approved, widely available and affordable drugs taken by millions of people for various conditions might be helpful to cancer patients. So they founded a nonprofit to do clinical trials for drug repurposing. Global Cures, by the way, I run from my dining table. Uh, so it's a very, you know, homegrown entity. And so we decided that we needed a bigger sandbox because we have so many things we want to do as part of this drug repurposing effort. For years, the Sukhatmis have worked to engage the medical establishment with repurposed drugs. Many of the drugs we're thinking about are now generic, there is no patent protection, uh, and so there's no drug company that's really driving the uh, uh, need and desire to find out if any of these drugs do work for some of the new ideas that we'd like to investigate. There's no financial sponsor, basically. Uh, so there's uh, not money to be made? There's not money to be made, yes, absolutely. There will be a lot of mixing of ideas, I hope, uh, and that should be the spirit of this meeting. Dr. Sukhatmi is the dean of Emory School of Medicine, and when he and Vitala came to Emory from Harvard four years ago, they founded the Morningside Center for Innovative and Affordable Medicine, focusing on repurposed drugs. But that focus has also pivoted for now to COVID, drugs to treat acute COVID and long COVID. Take fluvoxamine a widely available, inexpensive drug used to treat depression and obsessive-compulsive disorder. 
A recent study shows that in those who followed the protocol when taken in the early stages of COVID, hospitalizations fell by 65 percent and deaths fell by 90 percent. We've written a recent review on this and uh, there are properties where it may be directly antiviral, uh, but also it, it probably most important property is that it dampens the immune response in a way uh, that uh, we feel is helpful for the treatment of uh, COVID patients. I can tell you right now in my long COVID uh, folder that we have about 30 drugs that I have come up with, and I'm sure if you talk to other people, there may be other drugs that they could add to it that we could test for long COVID. To understand long COVID, you have to understand other conditions that look a lot like it and not by coincidence. People think that long COVID is a new entity. Uh, but I would venture to say that it is actually a uh, new incarnation of an old entity. Post-viral syndromes have been around a long time. The most common one is myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome, a long misunderstood condition whose symptoms of debilitating fatigue, disrupted sleep, brain fog, and a sense of being unwell after even the smallest physical or mental exertion looks strikingly similar to long COVID. Researchers are exploring the overlapping nature of these conditions. There is some evidence that COVID-19 can also trigger another syndrome, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. These are folks who get, uh, whose heart rate goes up dramatically when they uh, sit up or stand up and can also feel dizzy and a whole bunch of other uh, sort of symptoms. Many long COVID patients like Norma Perez are living with these symptoms. Researchers believe COVID may also trigger mast cell activation syndrome. Mast cells are blood cells that are part of your immune system. And when an infection occurs, these cells send out chemicals like histamine or serotonin to other cells to alert them to the intruders. But in mast cell activation syndrome, the cells go haywire and send out too much of the chemicals, which can cause chronic itching, rashes, headaches, pain, digestive issues, a fast heart rate, fatigue, and fainting. Once again, symptoms as long COVID. I'm going to give you one medication called Asmanax. People like Dr. Trong are using this information to treat patients symptomatically, patching together treatment plans based on individual symptoms like ADHD medications or antidepressants for the brain fog and fatigue or antihistamines and allergy medications for other patients to help their symptoms. The drugs I'm talking about are drugs like famotidine, which is taken for acid reflux by many people, cetirizine for allergies, beta blockers uh, and other high blood pressure medications. All of these drugs are very well known, taken by millions of people for different uh, diseases that are very common. There is no reason why the, that physicians cannot prescribe some of the things that we're talking about and for which, and uh, 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 that there be tools available to gather that data. The medical world lives by hard data, and these repurposed drugs, FDA approved and largely safe, do not have that hard data for treating long COVID. The studies cost money. That's one problem, and it's a big problem, but it's not the only problem. The other is there's competition for these sorts of trials because pharma, uh, who is developing new drugs, and we're all for developing new drugs, uh, generally pays more uh, to these physicians to do their trials. And so uh, one is money, one is finding the right physicians to get engaged and be supportive of these trials. And a third is just having the patients. That's how we got into this. The Sukhotmis talk about the need for real world data. I know she's gone through several rounds of testing. Pat Aronson is one of those real world examples. That they were really, really diligent. We visited her at home one week after Dr. Trong put her on ADHD medication for her brain fog and fatigue and gabapentin for the pain and tingling. The meds really, I'm shocked at how quickly they have helped because I'm on the lowest dose of Ritalin and I'm on the lowest dose of gabapentin, but those have made a huge difference. My name is Dr. Karima Benamer. I'm, I'm a neurohospitalist. Dr. Benamer is a neurologist who practices in the hospital, and during COVID, she was seeing something in some patients she had never seen before. We noticed that um, a lot of patients who had COVID who were in the ICUs were very confused. Um, and a lot of them were very agitated, requiring massive doses of sedation. 
it turned out that that agitation was actually part of a spectrum of what is now, what we know now is dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction. And the agitation was one facet of it, at least in a subset of patients. The autonomic system regulates involuntary body functions, such as heartbeat, blood flow, breathing, and digestion. Dysautonomia means a dysfunction of that system. I remember very clearly uh, a nurse in the COVID unit she, would, she was walking by me and she said, here he goes again, my patient gets pissed off every 40 minutes on the clock. And this rhythmic, cyclic thing is something that we see in dysautonomia. So it, it perked me up right away and I said, what do you mean every 40 minutes? And she said, I don't know what it is, but every 40 minutes his heart rate goes up, he starts breathing really fast, we can't control it with medications, and he gets very agitated. And that was what, it was the red flag for me that these patients are having dysautonomia. Dr. Benamer says the patient was having part of a dysautonomia syndrome called paroxysmal sympathetic storming. She worked with neurologist and researcher Dr. William Hu at Rutgers doing MRIs and gathering spinal fluid from these patients. We started looking into any signs of brain dysfunction in the spinal fluid, and we found that not only did we see signs of positive COVID, serology, so antibodies in the spinal fluid, but we also saw very high levels of cytokines. These cytokines seen in the spinal fluid are a sign that there's inflammation going on in the brain. Benamer and Hu published the first series on COVID encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. In long COVID, the autonomic system is sometimes still malfunctioning. The autonomic dysfunction the brain fog, the, you know, all these symptoms that we are seeing in long COVID um, are neurologic. Thank you for calling Emory Healthcare. Dr. Benamer says the high number of long COVID patients with anxiety and depression is also neurologic, part of the disease process. Deep breath in and out. Trong says 40 to 50 percent of his patients have some level of anxiety and depression. So I think that COVID is probably doing something to the brain or the brain activity in the acute phase. And now when you look at these post-COVID folks, you can also see that there is, you know, a weird um, hyperactivation, if you want to believe it, in terms of the brain fog activity, and then this whole anxiety and depression issue that's happening into these patients. A study by Oxford researchers found that a third of people who got COVID wound up with long COVID, anxiety and depression being the most common symptom reported. I loved the fast pace. I loved seeing 100 different complaints in the same day. I loved being there at people's hardest moment and being able to help them through it. 41-year-old Dr. Jeff Siegelman is an ER doctor at Grady Hospital in downtown Atlanta. He was on the front lines of the pandemic from day one. Um, it was just seemed to be just like a plague, like running through the city. In August of 2020, he got COVID. When I did get sick, I never thought that it would become this. But Jeff did more time than he or his family ever imagined. 40 days. So I had fevers uh, for 40 days. And the CDC guidance was you had to be uh, 10 days after the first symptom, plus 24 hours fever free, and I couldn't make it to be 24 hours. Melissa and the kids would leave my food and any groceries on the landing there. He isolated in his basement for 40 days, unable to be with his wife, Melissa, and their children, Emma and Ari. He would talk to them on the phone. So this is how we communicated each day. Or through the banisters. The fevers finally subsided, replaced with long COVID. So I wake up feeling well many, many mornings, and just as it has for this whole, whole 14 months, it sort of gets worse during the day, depending on what I've done. The more I exert myself physically or cognitively, meaning watching Zoom, um, having phone calls, um, the more I get brain fog, the more I get dizziness. Headaches and palpitations can come if, it's really, if I've really done way too much. Um, I still can't uh, taste a glass of wine. That's reason enough to get vaccinated. <laughs> After being out of work for five months, he is back at Grady. Since January, I've been able to work 
four hours a shift when normally my shift would be eight hours. Jeff says he's benefiting from repurposed drugs to treat his long COVID. For me, one of the things that my, my cardiologist actually recommended was, uh, was taking antihistamines. So I'm on Allegra and Pepsid and that really was what tipped me over the edge to be able to go back to work part time. Um, it helped lessen the fatigue and lessen, to the, fo lessen the fog to a, a level that I, could, that I could function. He also uses deep breath training to help him manage symptoms. Four in, four hold, four out, four hold. In the middle of our interview, Jeff asked to take a break. I may just take a second to breathe now if that's okay. Yeah, do it. Do whatever you gotta do. Did that, was that just helpful to you? Yep. What is it, what did it just do? So I don't know if you noticed I was starting to develop a tremor. I still have it a little bit, and that's part of when I get really, when I've exerted myself or, or um, when I've exerted myself, I start getting a tremor and the fog starts setting in, and so the, the deep breathing will help reset that a little bit. To be a physician who treated the worst of COVID, then to become the patient with long COVID has been eye-opening. It's common for those people to be sort of shooed out of the doctor's office and told, them, and told that they're fine, but they're not fine. And it's, uh, I regret that it's taken this for me to realize that. Jeff is still caring for patients, most of them now unvaccinated. A lot of people say, it's just a flu, it's gonna be fine, I'll get it and I'll move on. And that's what I thought last August. Here I am 14 months later with my life completely upended. The only way we know to not get long COVID is to not get COVID. And the only way we know to not get COVID is to get a vaccine. Brandon, it's good to see you. Same. 34-year-old Brandon Bryant is a court TV photographer. So right now I'm in Brunswick, Georgia. I'm getting ready to cover the Ahmaud Arbery murder trial here. Bryant was not vaccinated when he got COVID in June of 2021. He was vaccine hesitant at first, but was planning to get vaccinated after a work trip. He got COVID on the trip. Um, I almost died. In a suburban Atlanta hospital, he says doctors told him it didn't look good. The doctor told my mom and I right there, that uh, not only did I have COVID really bad, but I had pneumonia really, ba really bad. My right kidney was failing, and I had multiple blood clots at the same time. Brandon, who had no underlying conditions, tweeted from his hospital bed and says many friends and strangers told him they got vaccinated after they saw his story. Brandon went from 190 to 111 pounds, but he survived and credits his medical team and the prayers of his family. I'm going to get checkups. Bryant was off work for three months and is still on blood thinners and living with long COVID symptoms. Somebody tells me like something five minutes from now. I, I, I forget it. It's almost kind of like a fog where I kind of catch myself zoning out a little bit and then coming back to. Brandon has not received treatment for his long COVID symptoms, but as soon as his doctors cleared him, he got vaccinated. The vaccines protect against COVID and long COVID. Molnupiravir, the drug developed at Emory, reduces hospitalizations and deaths. The hope is that drugs could be created for long COVID. There may not be one pill for all of the folks who have long COVID. There may be five pills, each one based upon the different biology of the disease and which one is most active in that particular patient. There aren't enough clinics to treat people with long COVID and most are near academic centers. The goal is to educate family physicians so they can begin to treat a condition that for some may have lifelong effects. Part of that education will be to encourage the immediate use of existing drugs tailored to the symptoms a patient has. Government agencies such as the NIH and the FDA are beginning to support such efforts along with providing tools to keep track of the results. The National Institutes of Health has dedicated over a billion dollars to fund research into long COVID and could involve tens of thousands of patients. Many of the more than 11 million people living with long COVID have begun their own movement. Grassroots organizations such as Body Politic, Survivor Corps, and Long COVID Alliance serving as patient-led organizations dedicated to supporting, educating, and partnering in research. The epidemic has taken a toll on healthcare workers. Many are burned out and some have left the profession. Those who remain like Dr. Trong are pioneers by necessity, learning on the job. I think it's um, made me you know, grateful for the training I've had. I'm grateful for the physicians who have you know, put me through the ringer and have pushed me and have challenged me because I think that that's really helped um, Sorry. Um, it's really helped 
when, you know, you know, um, things were hitting the fan and, you know, chaos was just coming down on us. Um, and I think, I think those of us who've gone into it do it because we want to help people. You know, we want it to be that person that runs in when everybody runs away. And I felt like we, we did that in this pandemic, you know, when everybody was scared and, and worried about being infected, we were gowning up and going in. The worst you've gone through, you've already gone through. Not to be lost in all of this is the need for hope that life won't always be this way. It's going to be okay. And my hope really is that I can just return to working a full-time job, not relying on disability payments, um, and you know, being the dad and husband that I want to be. My son, who's, who's seven, will say, um, you know, Dad, uh, if, you, if you get better from long COVID, um, I'd like to do X, Y, Z, and you know, it really pulls at you. We are in the aftermath of a viral hurricane, still picking up the pieces, but making progress with each study, each new discovery. Science is always evolving and improving, um, and we did not know how to treat COVID when it started, and now we are pretty good at it. So I don't, I, I don't lose hope. <laughs>